Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fifth season of Let's Talk Elephants. I'm your host, Destiny Farley, and today I'll be interview- interviewing Rafael Arroyo, who is running for Nevada State Assembly in the upcoming election. Rafael identifies as a Republican, and some of his key issues are protecting the governor's veto, economic development, reducing regulatory burdens on businesses, law and order, and school choice. The Nevada State Assembly is a part of the legislative branch of our state government. And what a lot of people don't realize is that our state government has a much greater impact on our day-to-day lives than the federal government usually does. Um, It's not often that we get to spend considerable time getting to know our elected officials, the candidates, their perspectives in an authentic, organic way. So I wanted to give Rafael the opportunity to share who he is with all of you. Um, So before diving into any specific questions, Rafael, could you please just take a moment to introduce yourself briefly, um, share everyone, share with everyone a little bit of your background growing up, and then how you came, became interested in, in running for office. Yes, well, uh, thank you for having me on. Um, so, yeah, my name is Rafael Arroyo. I'm the candidate for Assembly District 41 uh, in the state legislature. That's like the south side of town, like Silverado Ranch area, um, by the South Point, stuff like that. So, basically, a little bit about me. So, I was born in Puerto Rico, uh, moved here to uh, straight to Las Vegas when I was six years old, grew up here, uh, graduated Rancho High School, and basically... Um, I, I, I went to UNLV for a semester. College is not my thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, went right to work and uh, started my own business when I was 23 and uh, been doing that since. You know, I have uh, 10 locations. It's called uh, Smog Plus DMV Services, and we do like auto repair and we do smog checks and we do registration services. And that's kind of how I ended up here. You know, so what happens is um, when you deal with government agencies, like you're dealing with... Uh, you know, people, I don't want to say unelected bureaucrats, but kind of, kind of, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, you, you deal with those people and sometimes they're not the most business friendly. So my experience was the following. Um, you know, we dealt with the DMV, government agency, and they're not the most business friendly people. So what would basically happen is they would put an obstacle in our way and then no one would really do anything about it. So it came down to a point where it was really threatening, you know, our, our, our business and the industry. And I had to basically figure out how to fight it. And that's where I learned like, oh, there's this whole apparatus of local state politics of how you get things done. So that's what I had to do. I had to, you know, get a lobbyist, work with a lobbyist and basically fight the system uh, to get a law passed to get over their obstacle. And so that was kind of my first introduction into local politics. And what it taught me was that one correct decision by an elected official can make such a huge difference in so many people's lives. Um, and, you know, I can, I, I'll get into the story a little bit because I think it's, uh, it's important. Um, basically, you know, they were trying to – sorry about that. They were trying to uh, – take away our access to process these transactions. And so we were trying to get it back. And we went back and forth, back and forth. And at the end of the day, what happens with a a bill or a law is that it has to go through a certain steps. And one of the steps is to get it out of what they call the committee. And so there'll be a smaller group of elected officials that hear the bill, and then they'll vote to get it out of the committee. Once it comes out of the committee, then it'll vote in the total legis- in the whole legislature on the assembly side, on the Senate side, then it goes up to the governor to sign it. But getting it out of the committee is basically you know, the most important thing, because if you don't get it out, you're never going to get it done. Right. And what happened was uh, the legislation that we proposed, um, the DMV came back and said, this is going to be too expensive. It's going to cost you guys $5 million and nobody's going to spend this money. So what they would call that, they would call that killing the bill. Like the bill was dead. And basically what happened is, um, you know, it was the last day to get this bill out of the committee. If you don't get it out, the bill's dead and then you're, you're done. And so I flew up there like the night before, cause we weren't expecting this to happen. So I flew up there the night before and we had no plan, right? We're, I'm in the government building. We have no plan. And basically, um, I just happened to, they they said, you know, the lobbyist was like, you go to this room, I'll go to this room, we'll try to talk to some legislators, see what we can figure out, try to get something done, cool. So I end up going to a a hearing, and I'm sitting there, and I notice that the chair of the committee, so that's the person that's in charge of hearing those bills, 
was presenting her own bill in this room that I was in, in this other, in this other committee hearing. And so she does her presentation. She gets up and like I chase her down and I'm like, hey, please, please, please. And I beg her. I was like, please, can you give me five minutes? Like, you know, she knows who I am because I'd already presented in front of her. I was like, please give me five minutes. Like we're getting ripped off. Like this is a problem. You know, a lot of people are going to suffer. And, you know, she's like, all right, I'll, I'll give you five minutes. So I waited an hour outside her office, you know, and then she finally gave me the five minutes. And it was probably she ever actually gave me about seven minutes. But in those seven minutes. I had to basically give the, you know, the tightest, best explanation slash pitch of my life right. to save, you know, not only my business, but all of these other business owners. And she looked at the information that I presented and she goes, you know what? This isn't right. We're going to do something. And 20 minutes later, she had a deal and we had a deal and it changed my life forever. Yeah. So from that moment, I was like, I know that. That one correct decision from an elected official can make such a big difference. Um, I wasn't thinking like, oh, I'm going to run for office next year. That was actually in, back in 2019. I just thought, you know, maybe one day in the future. And yeah. so, you know. Okay. Yeah. I relate to you a lot. Um, my personality is very much, I'm very much wired that same way, where if I feel like something is wrong or we can improve something or we should be doing it better or, you know, this this isn't fair, I have something like visceral in me where I have to say something about it. Like I just, I just can't. And I've been like that since I was young. And I had to learn at like a young age that you really have to pick and choose your battles, especially when you're dealing with bureaucracies and things like that, because it takes energy. It takes a lot out of you. I've shared this story multiple times on different episodes, so I won't get too far into it. But when I was in high school, um, I experienced something similar where I had um, an issue with the valedictorian policy. So at our school, there, there were three schools in the valley. It was Coronado Green Valley and I think Palo that had a different valedictorian policy than the other schools in Clark County. So at those three schools, because they're very competitive academically, there was this rule that if you retook a class, it, even if you had a 4.8, even if you had, even if you were ranked one, if you retook a class, you're disqualified from being valedictorian. And they, I had, I had retaken two classes. I got like an 89 in them and an A is 90. And I retook them over the summer to make sure that they were an A. So I did more work than the people the first time, you know, they got it the first time. And the school had made an error and sent me a notification that I was valedictorian. And then they tried to retract it after, like two weeks later. And I like went to this to the meeting to possibly give the speech at graduation. I signed the paper. My mom had posted it on Facebook. Like <laughs> it was a whole thing. And then they called me down to the counselor's office and tried to like undo it. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm like, even if that is the rule, you guys have to honor this now because you fucked it up. Like that's that, that's wrong. It's wrong to do the policy is wrong to begin with. Second of all, like, what does it cost you to let me walk, you know, or to wear a different color gown? And they're like, well, if we do it for you, we have to do it for everybody. And it's like, how many how many cases of this are in the school right, right now? Like, you only had 30 valedictorians. There can't be that many, you know, it was a whole thing. And so my principal wouldn't meet with me. We went above him. There was a conflict of interest with, I think it was this, not the superintendent. There was someone else above him. But the person we were talking to had a daughter that was a valedictorian at Coronado. So there was a conflict of interest. So I ended up escalating it up to Mike Barton, who was the chief academic officer at the time for CCSD. This is when I'm a senior in high school. I'm getting ready to graduate. I'm, I'm, I do a million things in school. I was speech and debate, cheer, I'm trying to like finish out high school, apply for college, and I'm fighting the school district to change this policy. And it gave me a lesson in bureaucracy and how few people actually give a shit, you know? <laughs> and most people that are in positions of power, at least that I was dealing with at that time, they, they are there for themselves and to be self-serving. And I genuinely cared. Like, I cared. I'm like, this this affects me. Like, I, that's where my depression and anxiety first started is, like, that year of high school because I was I was disappointed in the world. I'm like... 17, 18 years old, and that was my first experience of, like, there's so few people that care just because you care or just because it hurts you 
doesn't mean the people that have the right to make the decision are going to care. And that was like a wake up call for me. And it like, it really sucked the life out of me because I felt like this is, this is right. This is just the right thing to do. And I'm having to sell you on it as a 17 year old. And you're, did you, you're, did you get it? So I didn't get to walk, but they did end up changing the policy, but it was for like a few classes for, after me. For the future. Starting class of 2021. All right. And so it was worth it to me, you know, like it, it ended up changing, but it's hard. Like yeah. it's really hard to care. Yeah. No, I mean, go, going up against the system, a lot of people get discouraged because they don't understand it. Right. And that's one of the things that, um, you know, and, and I'll get into the story how I actually became, I guess I'm a politician now, but mm -hmm. I'll get into it in a, in a second. But people need to understand how the process works and they understand that it, you can be part of the process. And it actually doesn't take that much because so many people are not involved, right? So many people don't care that just a little bit of mobilization can get a lot done. Right. And so, you know, um, the, the reason that I'm here now as a candidate is so that happened in 2019. Um, I had to, not to the same extent of like battling back and forth, but I had, you know, I got some legislation passed in 2021 and then again uh, last year in 2023. And so when I was up there last year, um, you know, some people, there was a lobbyist, there was a, a you know, a couple elected officials. They were like, hey, uh, the governor's having like an event, like, a, and, they're, and he's looking for candidates, you know, we think you should go. And I was like, all right, I mean, I'll check it out, you know. So I go and then I talk to his team and, you know, they kind of give me a little background of what it would be. And I'm like, all right, you know, and then I sit down, you know, talk to the governor. He kind of tells me what, what his plan is and. And that's, uh, you know, and that's when I was like, okay, like this is, you know, cause it's a sacrifice. Like it's not, you yeah. know, like I have a business, I got a family, like it's not like, oh, this is like some fun thing. I mean, there's, there's fun aspects to it, but it's work, right? It's work. But if you want to get anything done in life, like you have to do the work, it's not going right. to get done by itself. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I, I want people to know that getting the work, getting the work done is the only way it's going to happen. Right. You right. can't just sit and complain and then just some magic happens. That's not that's not how it goes. Right. So can you I think you kind of briefly described it at the beginning. But again, just kind of review what exactly the Nevada State Assembly does for people that don't fully understand or what you'd be responsible for if you were elected. Yeah. So the, the, so the state assembly. So that's part of the legislature. And so there's three branches of government. There's the executive, which would be like the governor and some other elected positions there. There's the judicial branch and then there's the legislative branch. So legislative branch, it's going to consist of the assembly. And that's like they're broken down into districts with like different areas. And um, they're your local state representatives. So they make the local state laws. And then there's another side of the legislature called the Senate. They have bigger districts. And it's kind of, you know, it mirrors the federal system. Right. And then basically you pass a law in one house, the assembly, it goes to the Senate, it passes there, then it gets sent to the governor for signature. Okay. So that's, you know, the, the point of a local state representative is to make your local laws. And why is that important? You, you kind of said in the beginning, it affects you more than the federal stuff on your day-to-day -day life. And it 100% does, right? So if there's laws on, you know, because there's municipal laws, right? The city laws, there's county laws, like all those things matter as well. Like all of these things matter. But at the state level, basically the way I think that people should take the best example from COVID. If you had a strong state legislature and government or governor, right? You didn't do all the lockdown stuff, like just period, right? Florida, Texas, like maybe you did a little bit, but you didn't have to, right? And so that is a is a prime example of how could it could directly affect you. Whereas if you were in a different with different representation, you know, a lot of people lost their businesses. They lost their businesses because of their local state law said, no, we're going to lock it down because this is the best decision. And so that's, you know, that's one of the things that I try to tell people is like, look, this just happened. You need to have local state representation that represents your values. Because right. if you don't, you know, you, there's going to be consequences. Two other examples that come to mind are also like um, the legalization of marijuana and abortion now that Roe v. Wade has been overturned. So because we have that system of checks and balances in America, 
something can look different on a federal level, right? Like technically weed is not legal federally, but in each state has the right to make its own laws for its people. So you can buy marijuana in Nevada. Same with abortion. Now that Roe v. Wade has been overturned, it goes to the to the states for them to decide what is going to be allowed in within that state. So it's it's really important. Yeah, yeah. States, um, yeah, states' rights issue. You know, those are states' rights issues, and that's you know that the the and that's one of the things. I mean, people should you know look into it. There's a reason why. Uh, you know, people say, oh, we're the best country in the world. But no, 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 this is the best system, at least the best idea that's ever been built. And if we continue to let it deteriorate, it's going to fall apart because all empires fall um, unless you maintain them. Um, you know, I saw a, a guy say that a little bit ago and it was great, you know, but that's what yeah. you have to do. So do you consider yourself a politician now? Um, I guess by definition I am. I don't ever use the word identify. I don't identify as anything, but... Well, um, do you, do you, like, when you think of yourself and if you were to describe yourself, would politician be a word that comes to mind? No. Okay. No. No, because I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I would describe myself as a business owner, as a father. Like, that's, that, those are the things that define me. Um, you know, the politician has a negative connotation. Like a lot of things have negative connotations, uh, but it's for good reason. Um, right. you know, where I'm from, Puerto Rico... I mean, it's it's so corrupt, and it's and it's weird because it's base. Puerto Rico is like, um, you know, they're all basically leaning liberal or left, and it's just there's just different varying degrees of it. There's not really a lot of conservative um, in Puerto Rico like that, but they still fight amongst each other, mm -hmm. right? They still, uh, you know, they lie, cheat, steal, steal a lot of stealing. Um, and so, you know, that happens. So there's there's a reason why, you know, politicians have a bad reputation. Right. Um, so how are you different from like a stereotypical politician? Like what separates you from them? Oh, because I like I know what it is to get, uh, you know, to fight the system. Right. So I'm going in there to say, OK, there's things that can't because this is the thing y you can make a lot of changes positive changes, right? But you have to make them within the system. Like that's the only way to get it done. So there is a way to do it. And the way to do that is, okay, you look at policies that make sense. And then you try to promote those policies, have people elect representatives that push those policies and get them passed. So the, the only way to fix it is to use the system to fix it. Okay. Yeah. I mean, so again, as I described, we're, we're very similar. Um, and actually fighting the system and going through that process is what has made me not want to be a politician and not want to run for office because sometimes it feels like you're like a one-man army and you, you do need people on your side, right? And so I'm going back to get my master's in journalism this August at UNLV and I have no desire to work for the mainstream media because I already know how controlled that narrative is. I'm not I'm not a personality type that can be controlled and I I never explored political science for the same reason where it's like if you walk into a room and you're going against the grain, you're going to stick out like a sore thumb, yeah. right? And you need you need people on your side and this is what I feel like we haven't realized as a country yet is that there's way more of us than there is of them, of the people that, you know, I don't want to like stare. I don't like to stereotype in general. So I don't want to group every single politician as a terrible person. Right. But there's a lot of corruption and that's, that's no yeah. secret. So what people don't realize is that like, it's all us, like it's all citizens. And if we were to demand change and if we were, I don't want to use the word rebel, but if we were just to speak out and and boycott certain things or not reelect certain people or or protest or do whatever, like things would have to change because there's just more of us. It's just yeah. basic math. Yeah. You know? And but the the problem is that people are scared to risk to take that risk, right? right? You just said, Oh, well, when you fight the system, I don't want to fight it anymore. Well, it's that way on purpose. Um, you know, people that want to control things and see an advantage of being in control, they're not going to want you to participate. But the system in this country is about citizen participation. So the more people that actually participate, the easier it is to have a better system. 
Right. Um, and, you know, uh, <laughs> I'll say this. So you could go to uh, – during COVID, I went to Utah a lot. And uh, in southern Utah, they had mask mandates. They did. There was laws that said you had to wear a mask, just like down here. But I don't know, 70% of the people just didn't do it. Mm-hmm. That's it. They just didn't do it. Yeah. And it was not only the regular people, but it was, you know, like the cops weren't going to come to be like, this guy's not wearing a mask. They didn't. They were just like, it is what it is. Yeah. You know, so if people just realize that, hey, there is strength in numbers, then, you know, then, yeah, things can get done. But there is a risk. There's a risk to everything. Right. But I would challenge people to learn any movement. People take risks, right? Yeah. But learn history. Like, I mean, the founding fathers of this country, they, uh, you know, some of them got killed, their families tortured, mm-hmm. and some of them were, like, older. I think George Washington was in his 40s. But some of the people that signed the Declaration of Independence were, like, 18, yeah. You know, so it's like it's a wide range. Like you can do stuff now. You can do it at any age. It's not uh, it's not like, oh, I have to wait or no, you have to learn the subject, try to understand the system and then try to work within it. Yeah. You know, what's funny is as you're talking. So there's there's Republican and Democrat. Right. As as parties, as political parties. And then there's conservative and liberal. And people tend to like group those things together as one. Like, oh, if you're conservative you're a Republican. If you're liberal, you're a Democrat, but they're actually separate things, right? Because Republicans and Democrats are like certain policies and parties you might identify with. Liberal and conservative are mindsets. And as you're talking, by definition, you would actually have like a liberal mindset because liberal, all it means by definition is open to change and kind of willing to rock the bow and switch things up. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I see, you know, it's what the thing is with words and definitions, they change. So I've, I've heard people say, I'm a classical liberal, right? Because so it's like, I'm a classical liberal. Because some of the founding fathers would consider themselves classical liberals. Um, but there, there is a distinction. Most Democrats are quote unquote liberal sometimes. Right. But there's a lot of liberal Republicans. Or there's a lot more like what they would call moderate Democrats, conservative type Democrats. Right. But I would say this, the Democratic Party has changed Um definitely changed in my lifetime, changed a lot more in the past. It used to be the, uh, you know, the party of the KKK. But now right. it's, uh, you know, back like so in like the 2000s, it was anti-war. Democrats were anti-war, right? They were very against Bush's wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, this is at a federal level. Local politics is a little different, to be honest. It's actually much more bipartisan than you would think. It's starting to split in the wrong way. Um, but they were, you know, they were anti-war and they were free speech, right? It was usually in the early 2000s, it was like the, you know, like the Christian right wing that were like the Puritans on, you know, decency and all this stuff. And then they were like, no, free speech, free speech. And then it's kind of the pendulum has swung all the way the other way now mm-hmm. where they're like, you know, now they police you on all of these different things. And now they're the pro-war party, which I cannot understand at all. Yeah. Um, but but it changes. I mean, people change and uh, definitions change. Um, I think it's about knowing what your values are and then voting that way, right? right. You need to vote for the candidate. Don't vote for the party. And that's right. what I would say. I'm, I'm a Republican because more of my values align with the Republican Party than the Democratic Party. But I will say there is a lot of Democrats that do a lot of good things, especially at the state level. Right. I mean, I got help from a lot of Democrats when I was doing that because these are people that actually did care about small business. They cared. So it's not, you know, it's not always like, oh, you're on the other team. It's more like, okay, what are you about? Right. Yeah. I was going to say, as I was, so I have a, a bachelor's in communications. So a lot of my degree is studying how we say things. Um, what we're saying, the words we're using, the tone, there's all these different nonverbals, right? You have the words and then you have everything else. So I'm very familiar with like rhetoric. And as I was reading like your website, it's very, it comes across very approachable and bipartisan in a way, right? So there was, um, there was a section on here, I put it in here, where you're describing, um, you know, the importance of having like checks and balances and, you know, right now, you phrase it in a way that was digestible for me as like a moderate or an independent, right? Because you were talking about how right now there's a, um, 
like a Democrat majority. Yeah. Um, and you wanted to run, you know, as a Republican seat to kind of balance that out because it could end up affecting the governor's veto. And it's like, I like the way it was phrased because it's not just about Republican, 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 we're better, we're superior. It was very much like, no, the checks and balances is what matters. And it, it, it wasn't so much like vouching for your ideas and your principles, but the, the, well, your, I, you, it was your ideas and your values and your principles, but that being the, the balance, that was the most important thing. And that's what I, I liked about it. Um, you identify as a Republican. Would you describe yourself that way? Would you describe yourself as, as conservative or would you say yeah, more? I, I would, I would describe myself as a conservative person that believes in the constitution. I believe, uh, the system of America is the best system that's ever been invented for government as far as we know um and it's it's shown why but the system has been under attack since day one right since since they declared independence it was under attack since you know they won the war the revolutionary war it's been under attack it's always been under attack because the ideas are so far out there to give the people so much power and then uh, i think one of the best things about the constitution and the way the laws were written is it gave room for growth, right? right? A lot of people don't know that a lot of the founding fathers were anti-slavery, but they couldn't get it done. They couldn't get all 13 colonies to, to jump on board with a war if they took slavery out. So they made a compromise. I mean, it's a despicable compromise. I get that. Um, but they left room in the language for that to work itself out, which, you know, unfortunately it took a civil war and, and a lot to get it done, but it, but it got done. Um, so I think that's one of the good things about the system is there is room, you know, to grow. And I mean, we're almost 250 years in and it's it's doing OK. Um, right. it, could be better. <laughs> it could definitely be better. <laughs> but but yeah. that's why you're here. Yeah. Um, so what made you overall lean Republican instead of Democrat? Have you always because you said you grew up in, in a, a territory that was mostly Democrat. Well, I mean, so. I was there till six. I grew up in Vegas. I mean, I, I wasn't. uh are your parents Republican or are they Democrat? Um Yeah. I mean, but they weren't like politically active like that. Okay. Right. They weren't like beating stuff down my throat when I was growing up or anything. Um, I'm pretty sure they voted for Obama, to be honest. Um, so it's not, you know, they were just kind of centrist, you know, type. And so what what makes me more conservative is just understanding that human nature can be exploited or it can have negative consequences. So when you enable someone, like sometimes you want to help and then you end up enabling and it, it, it leads to like worse consequences. Um, also, understanding how money works is really important. Most people don't understand how money works. Most people think that the government has money. The government has no money. The government taxes you and takes your money and then spends it. But they never take in enough taxes taxes to spend, you know, on, on their budget. So what they do is they borrow money to spend some more. Mm -hmm. And so that's, you know, that's the, the spending is one of the, the, you know, and government accountability, right? So what happens is people go, and this happens in Puerto Rico all the time, is there'll be a government contract and the government contract gets handed to the cousin or the friend or this guy and they just kill it. They get all this money and then the job, sometimes it doesn't even get done. But or it's a it's, you know, bad quality, bad, you know, people are ripping off the government. So that, you know, that sort of like the fiscal part, the, the you know, is where I say, OK, yeah, these this definitely aligns more with my values. I don't think that we can spend our way to success. Um, there's certain areas that obviously need more funding. There's a balance there. But I don't think we can just borrow and spend our way to success. And I don't think that saying the government is the solution for every problem, I don't agree with that either. So I think uh, a lot of Democrats lean more to like, well, the government can provide this service and we can provide this service at a great quality, you know, at a cheaper price. But I don't think that's true at all. I, th I think they really believe it, um, but I don't think that's true at all. I think uh, there has to be a balance in what government does and doesn't do. Um, but most of the time, I think the private sector is going to do a better job. Yeah. Okay. So b backtracking a little bit, you said that this was something 
that you just kind of fell into? Like you had thought about maybe running for office before, but someone else had prompted the idea to you and you checked it I out? I mean, it, yeah, it, it wasn't like, uh, it wasn't like, oh, I'm going to do this this year. It just happened, right? It just happened. Now, it wasn't that I don't want to do it. It was it, the opportunity presented itself and I took it. Um, but at the same time, I had to ask myself, what are my children going to say, right? Because if right now the way that the the direction of the country and the state is going, we're not going in a good direction. So if nobody stands up and fights, what's going to happen? Yeah, so what are you I, leaving to your kids? Yeah, so I'm looking at them. It's like, what am I going to say? Oh, I had this opportunity, but I didn't take it because, you know, I was focused on, you know, trying to make more money. But is my money going to be worth anything if we continue to just spend on nonsense? Or are these policies, like if we allow people to continue stealing, just theft, is that going to be a place where I want my kids growing up? Like, mm -hmm. you know, how much money am I going to have as a small business? I mean, one of my businesses got burned down by a homeless person. Really? Wow. Got burned down by a homeless person. You know, she's, uh, it was a, a lady who's probably, you know, on drugs or something. Never, I mean, I have her like on video for a, a few seconds. We're never going to find her. But my thing is this, that business right now, that was in February, it's still down, right? So that's four months. It's still down. Um, if that was my only business, my life would be over. Right. Okay. So it matters. Like having a functioning society that is not, you know, pro crime or lenient on crime, like it matters um, because these are people's livelihoods. You know, you can't just go into a store and just steal whatever you want. I mean, that was, you know, I was I was knocking on some guy's door and he was uh, he was telling me, he's like, yeah, you know, the Vaughn's right next. To me. He's like, yeah, I just saw a guy walk out with a cart full of stuff. Mm -hmm. Nobody does anything. It's like, OK, well, in some places, if you do something, that person's the one that's going to go to jail for trying to stop the thief because, mm -hmm. you know, that happens. You see that in New York a lot. Um, Nevada has a little bit better laws, but people don't want to get involved because they have a risk of them getting in trouble. But if you allow that person to come in and take a shopping cart full of stuff, what is the business supposed to do? Right. They're losing thousands of dollars a day mm -hmm. in theft. So what are, what are, what's going to happen? Your prices are going to go up. There's inflation, of course, but the prices go up because of loss too. That's a part of it. So prices are going up because we're allowing people to steal so much mm -hmm. um, and not get in trouble for it. It's just a slap on the wrist. So that's one of the things that kind of passed, uh, you know, in the last few legislative sessions as like a crime reform bill, and it's not working, right? You see that they tried that in California, Oregon, you know, Washington, these other Western coastal states and their big cities, and their big cities are getting worse and worse. So do we want Nevada to become that? We don't. So you got to mm -hmm. put policies in place to bring that back. So what goes into putting together a campaign like this? Like, do you have a team? Is it planning? It's got to be expensive. Like, how long do you have to do it for? Like, what does it look like on your end? Um, well, I mean, you can work it as much as you want, right? You could, it's just like any job, like um, like your own business. You can work it as much as you want. So it could be a 60-hour-a-week thing. It could be a 10-hour-a-week thing. Depends on how much work you're willing to put in. But it does take, you can't, some people do do it by themselves. Extremely difficult. Mm -hmm. Extremely difficult. And that presents barriers of entry. Um, and it's unfortunate that there's so much money involved in politics um, because it takes money to talk to people. Like you can go door to door, but I go to door to door and maybe one out of four people answers the door. Right. right? So, I mean, how much can you get done? So what do you have to do? You have to advertise to them, right? Okay, well, here's my website. Well, website's okay. That's pretty easy. But how do they get there? How do they even know it exists? Okay, so, okay, well, maybe you send out mail, right? You send out, you get all these postcards in the mail, all this political stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you get Instagram ads, you get Facebook ads, you get stuff on Netflix, like all of these things to try to get you to see, okay, this is the candidate, you know, that's what's going on. But no, it takes uh, uh, it takes a lot of money and that's that's a problem. Um, and but, but at the same time, what I like to tell people is, there's a lot of money. It takes a lot of money to run a campaign. There's a lot of money in politics. Millions of dollars are spent, not at the state assembly level, maybe hundreds of thousands, but, you know, federal seats, congressional seats, U.S. Senate seats, even a governor's race, millions of dollars are spent, right? So if people are spending millions of dollars, your vote matters. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Your vote matters. Trust me. 
because right. they're spending so much money just to try to get you there. Right. It matters. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, you know, people have to understand that your vote matters and you have to participate in the elections because if you don't, you know, you're, you're not going to get represented properly. Who are you running against? Are you running against other Republicans or Democrats or what does it look so, like? So right um, in the beginning, so I had a primary election, um, which was a couple days ago. So I, I won that. So mm-hmm. basically what happens is you go against uh, kind of your own team, like Republican will go against the Republican if there's somebody vying for the seat. And it's kind of like the semifinals. And then you go to the final to go against the other parties. Um so there's multiple parties. There's like Libertarian Party, Independent American Party. But in this race, only the Democrat, you know, who's the incumbent. So she's been elected in this seat for a long time um, is running. So now I would be going up against her in November. OK, so the incumbent now is a Democrat. Correct. And usually it's hard to get an, incum- an incumbent out. Oh, huh? extremely. Is there... Is there term limits for this position? I don't even know what it looks like at the state yeah, level. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's term limits, but they're like 12 years. 12 they, years? Yeah, oh, wow. Yeah, 12 years. Who's the, who is it right now? I don't know if I'd even recognize her name. Oh, her name is Sandra Howdigy. Okay. Yeah. I, don't, I'm, I mean, I may have heard it over the... How long has she been in office? 2016. Okay. So what year is it? 2024? Yeah, yeah. Eight years, eight years. <laughs> Eight years. Yeah. So, and what are what are the terms? Is it two or two four? year terms? Two okay. year terms. So there's the assembly, and then you you can go to the senate and do. Uh, there's four year terms there, so you could go to the senate and do another twelve. So basically, she's been reelected four times. Yeah. Okay. Sixteen, seven, sixteen. If she's if she's 18, eight years 20, in. Twenty two. Yeah, four times. Okay. She's okay. been elected four times. Yeah. Okay. How do you feel? Do you feel like um, you have a shot? Or are you nervous? Yeah. Or well, look, I mean. I would, she's what they call the majority leader. So she's like second in command. Um, okay. She's a very skilled person. She's very talented, very intelligent. Um, I give her all the respect and the credit in the world to, you know, to get where she's at. I disagree with her on some things. And I think that if we make those contrasts, I think that people will understand that the direction that she was taking us is not really the best direction. She's been in office for eight years. She's tried it. Um, and I, I just don't think some of the things that she's done are working. So yeah. it's just a matter of educating people and getting them to understand that there's a different, right? There's a different option. Mm-hmm. There's a different option. We're going in the same direction for a long time. Yeah. So do you really think that, you know, this, uh, you know, this uh, platform is working? Because this is the same platform that she is running is the same platform that's being ran in California and these big cities. Yeah. So is that what you want? You want Las Vegas to be like LA or San Francisco? Mm-hmm. If you don't, then you probably want to vote in a different direction. Yeah. I appreciate how you talk about people that you don't agree with. I feel like it's different. It's refreshing. I don't feel like um, more, I guess, seasoned politicians speak that way. You know, maybe they do if they're in a room full of people that don't agree with them, but it's it's refreshing to hear, just so you know. Um, what would you say are, like, the most important qualities of being a good leader? Because you're, you're running for a position where you're you're going to be a leader. You're going to be representing people of in our state. So when you're going into a – and, you know, you've owned businesses, you're a father, like, as, as a whole, maybe not even just in the political realm, but what are the most important qualities of being a good leader to you? Um. I think it's willing to do the work. It's perseverance. It's perseverance over anything. Um, And then trying to learn from your errors, right? Uh, In business, I made so many errors in the beginning. And I still make errors now. I mean, there's so many places to improve. But it's perseverance. And I think that's what people don't – like, you can definitely achieve in America 100%. You can definitely achieve in America if you persevere. That's it. You have to just keep grinding, keep going. Um, and so perseverance is one. Being set in your values is another, right? You don't want to compromise yourself, um, especially for money. That happens a lot at, you know, it happens a lot more at the federal level because it's a lot bigger dollar amounts. Mm-hmm. At the state level, can it happen? Yes, and it does. Um, it's not as pronounced because the money is not as big, but it still happens. So, you know, is the money worth it for you, right? Uh, you know, I I forgot what the exact quote was, but as the, the guy was like, basically, like, what is the, what is your price? Right. You know, like, what is your price? Is it is it ten grand? Yeah, is it a hundred? Is yeah. it a million? Is it ten million? Is it a hundred million? If your price 
that's what it was. It was like, if your price is not your life, then, you know, then then it's not going to work. Right. So, you know, it's uh, you have to just be very set in your values um, and understand, OK, what what are the reasons that I'm doing this and why? And then try to check your ego. Like, right. because if you are a leader, if you are in charge, uh, there's always going to be that uh, that pull on your ego of like, you know, everything, you know, you're, you're making all the right decisions. And sometimes you have to be that way to be a leader. You have to be confident in what you're doing. You can't second guess yourself. You got to pull the trigger on things because time runs out. But, you know, you have to be willing to learn from your mistakes and willing to learn and listen to other people as well. Right. Um, that leads me into my next question. You kind of answered a part of it, but I wanted to ask if you were elected and, you know, I don't know how many people you already have worked with or know, like if you were to become elected, if you've already worked with the people that would be your peers and colleagues, but let's say you were to become elected and you find yourself in a position where you're surrounded by people that you feel are, are corrupt or in it for the wrong reasons or are there for power or ego or pride or whatever the case may be. How would you manage that situation both internally and externally? So like internally protect yourself from like if nine out of the nine out of they say something like if nine out of 10 people that are around you are one way, you're not going to be the one out of 10 that's different. So in, (laughs) well, psychologically, scientifically, they say no, but I would like to know how you would manage it internally. And then also externally, if you would combat that or or do anything to try to fight that or you know what your strategy would be in an environment where you felt like maybe there's there's a lot of bad apples well that's why relationships are so important um you need to know people work better with people that they know right the relationships are very important i do know a lot of the people up there you know on the on the other side um and i've had great relationship with them there's been a few that don't like me so much mm-hmm. um but it but it happens so when you when they know you as a person it's a lot easier to say look we are th- we are here you're on one side i'm on the other side on this specific issue is there anything we can agree on right and if you have a good relationship with that person they'll be like you know, you may be able to find some common ground or you may not. And if you don't, you just go, we're going to have to agree to disagree on this one, but I'm not going to hate your guts forever. Right. Because that's not going to be productive into the future when we got to work on other things. Um, so the way I would handle it is just, I would try to defend my positions, right. With facts, logic, and, you know, reasons. And internally is just say, look, I'm not going to take it personal you have a different value set. I have to respect your value set, but I'm just going to disagree. And it's okay. It's okay to disagree with people. You can still be their friend, mm-hmm. right? You can still, you know, have them over for dinner. Like, you know, there's, and this is something that's happened in the last eight years, um, especially, you know, with, with, with Trump being this divisive figure that people are losing their families over politics. That's ridiculous. That's the whole reason I started my podcast (laughs) is for the reason that you're talking about, right? It's to show people, you know, you can have conversations even if you have different values or or you don't agree, you know? And I do feel like particularly in 2020, that's when we – like everything got exponentially worse, divisive. I thought we might be on the verge of another civil war, literally. Like that year was so intense. Yeah, I mean, but we're always, I mean, civil war is a strong term, but we're always at uh, informational war. There's always one side giving their information, the other side giving the other information. And the truth, you know, could be somewhere in the middle. Maybe one side is more right than the other. It's important to have a balance Right. It's important to have a balance, but it, it's also important to know what your values are and, and and understand that you have to just understand what the other side's position is. You have to understand the other side. Why do they want to do this? What is their purpose? A lot of times it may not be nefarious, but it could still be wrong. Mm-hmm. You know, so understanding that I think is really important. I mean, I talk to people and, uh, you know, they they're like, oh, well, I'm pro this and I'm pro that. And you're you're a Republican and I'm a Democrat. I'll never vote for you. And, you know, at the end of the 15 minutes, I go, listen, we don't have to agree on every single topic. But and this is a specific instance where I, I spoke with a lady um, and she was <laughs> she was outside cleaning her litter boxes. She had like eight litter boxes. And uh, 
you know, she's like, I don't have this many cats. And I'm like, okay, that's yeah. fine. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you have eight cats, you have eight cats. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, I told her, hey, look, you know, I'm in the neighborhood. I'm, you know, running for office. I want to see what the voter issues are. And she's like, oh, well, I'm a Democrat. And she went, like, that's exactly what she just went right down this line of like, I'm anti this and I'm, you know, and I'm pro this. And I was like, okay, well, like, well, what do you do? And she's like, well, I'm a preschool teacher. I was like, oh, okay, cool. So like, what do you think we can do to improve education? You know, and she's like, well, I mean, we need to keep this program going and blah, blah. And I was like, why? And she's like, well, because of this, this. And I was like, yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So, okay, that's something I would support. And I was like, well, what do you think about school choice? She's like, no, absolutely not. I was like, oh, all mm -hmm. right. Well, why? Well, I don't know. It's like, okay, well, you know, and then I explained to her, like, look, like, um, you know, one of the, the states uh, that's been a great model for this is Florida, for example. They were in the bottom in the 40s in education. They started increasing their school choice, so allowing, you know, parents to choose where the kids go to school, things like that. And uh, now they're like number three in the country, right? So it's like some policies work. Um, and so if you do some research on them and say, why is this working? You know, is it working? Why? Because it creates competition. You know, in this specific instance, it creates competition amongst the schools. Um, because if you're getting paid per head, you want to keep as many heads in your school as possible. So if you're doing a bad job, those heads are going to leave. You're not going to get the money. Your job is in jeopardy. Right. So there's a there's some you know there's some there's a stake there. Um, but you know there's an opposing side that says no. We just need more money to do the right thing. And then you know my my mother was actually a teacher in Clark County for 24 years. Um, high school, and you know, she dealt with all the nonsense, right? It was, um, you know, especially in, I mean, even the little I was talking to her, and even little kids now, you know, I've talked to a couple of teachers that teach elementary, like, but if you have a kid in high school, like, you know, he could be 6'3, 220 pounds, like, what, right. you got a, you know, 60 year old lady, like, trying to tell him to sit down, like, you know, if there's no respect there, there's a problem, and then if the administrators don't back you up, and there's no accountability for bad behavior, you know, and then if the administration is scared of the parents and teachers are scared of the parents because the parents come in and back up the kid. Mm -hmm. That's not something that was culturally done in this country, you know, I mean, maybe maybe even as close as 20 years ago. Right. If your teacher's saying something, you're probably going to listen to the teacher. Like, why is you like the teacher's telling me this? Like, why are you doing this? You know, the kid would be in trouble, but not today. Right. Not today. The parent will come and fight on behalf of the student. Now, sometimes, you know, there's a legitimate reason, but. The teachers don't have a safe environment. They're not being supported. And the administration only cares about graduation numbers. Is that really going to educate our, our children? You know, and a school choice is an answer to that because parents can then say, my kid's not doing good here. I'm going to take him somewhere else. And it forces people to compete and it forces them to work harder. Mm -hmm. And she heard you out. Did she receive it well? Or Oh, yeah, it was great. Um, by the end of the conversation, uh, she said, She's just like, you know, what was your name again? I told her, Raphael Royal. And she's like, if she, if she doesn't stop by my house, I'm going to vote for you. Mm -hmm. Like that. Yeah. You know, and w I mean, we probably disagreed on like, I don't know, four out of seven things we talked about. Yeah. But that that's what it takes. It just, right. you know, you, you have to understand. And, and what I say is this is supposed to be representative government. That's what our system is supposed to be representative. So I'm supposed to represent everyone, not just the side that I agree with all the time. Right. I have to represent everyone. So you need to take those other things into account and say, okay, are there ideas here? Are there ideas here that work? Are there ideas here that will help? Yeah. And, you know, if there are, then you have to, you know, you have to take those into consideration and get them yeah. done. It's a really refreshing perspective. Um, when you were talking earlier um, it reminded me of this book. I don't know if you you may have read it. If you haven't, you should read it because I think you'd like it. But it's called The Righteous Mind by Jonathan Haidt. And it's about – he's a clinical psychologist. He's been on Joe Rogan and stuff. It's this book entirely about why – it's – let me find the actual title of it. It's why good people are divided by religion and – yeah. The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion. And it go – it kind of breaks down the two-party system and the different values that each party – like I, I think I – th I read it like a year ago, a year and a half ago. But they, they break down basically like six values as uh, – for like humans that, that play a role in politics and, and religion and all these different things. And then they break down how each party appeals to those different values or how they don't appeal to them. 
And it talks about how the Republican Party has historically performed better in elections and with marketing and things like that because they apply to more values than the Democrats do. So there's two, I can't even remember what they are. There's two that are really important for Democrats that they like hone in on. But for Republicans, they try to touch on more of the values. So they do a better job of converting Democrats to vote for them than Democrats do converting Republic Republicans to vote for them. So that's why they perform better in elections and things like that. But a lot of it has to do with people being triggered because it is a values thing, right? And it's an identity thing. So people identify with their values, right? And if someone feels like if their value is threatened, they literally feel threatened yes, as that's, a person. That's that's the number one. You, you can't the you can't ident like your life is not your political party. You are a person. Separate right. yourself from that because you're taking it so personal um, that that it's hurting you, right? And that's how these families get split up. People don't want to talk to each other. Friendships, uh, things like that. I would say uh, from my perspective that more liberal or democratic policies appeal to the immediate emotion. Like, well, you know, we don't like, you know, there's homeless people on the street and they're doing drugs. We want them to do clean drugs. So we'll give them needles and pipes that are clean. So that way they don't get these diseases. It's like, okay, I understand the argument, but you're promoting drug use. So you're giving people needles, they're just going to continue to do the drugs. So no, like some things, you know, taking away some things does work. Um, and you can't make it, uh, you know, and the homeless problem is, 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 a, is a great example. So I, I spoke with a guy, he runs a nonprofit uh, called Vegas Stronger. And, you know, he had like a presentation, he had a couple of different speakers, and they all said pretty much the same thing. They said, never, ever give money to a homeless person. Because the odds are 95% of the time it will go to drugs or alcohol. If you want to help a homeless person, then you have to give them food, water, help them get to shelter, you know, if they need services to help them get to that. And they have a whole program. They got psychologists and they got, you know, housing and all. And they do a great job saving people. And one of the guys that spoke um, was like a former like addict, you know, and those are the best people because they understand what it's like. Right. And so, you know, they, they say that. So it's like, and then people are like, well, but I want to help, right? You see the guy on the corner, I want to help. I want to give him some money. It's easy. I feel good. I give him money. You know, he's, he needs food. That's what his sign says. But that's not what they do, right? On average, you know, on average. So you got to play the odds and go, okay, how do we actually help these people? Um, and it's not helping them by just giving them more money. It's helping them by saying there's some people that, unfortunately, the drugs and the alcohol have, have damaged them and they're 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 too far gone. They just need mental help. Yeah. Um, but there's a lot of people that are just you know they're struggling and they could be definitely recovered and reintegrated into society. We got to give those people that avenue uh, to do that. But the arguments usually appeal to the immediate emotion, like immediate relief, instead of looking at the long term. So my thing is, when you look at an issue, look at the long term, right? Like if you say, well, the government should give me money now because it's COVID, right? I need money now. It's like, okay, well, you can get money now, but what's the consequences of that? You're seeing the consequences right now. Everything's 30, 40% more expensive. Why? Because we just printed a whole bunch of money. And that creates inflation. People have to understand these concepts so they go, okay, well... Maybe there's another way around this. Maybe it's just, you know, we, we say, hey, take personal accountability. It's dangerous outside right now. You know, there's, you know, there's COVID out there, but you take your own risk and, 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 and you go out there and work. And maybe more people have chose that, a lot less money, maybe it would have been in a, different, in a different place. You can see the economies of states that didn't shut down at all or didn't shut down as long are faring a lot better. And the countries that also didn't shut down, their economies are faring a lot better as well. So out of all the issues that you have on your agenda, because we've touched on a variety of things, you know, economic, um, helping small businesses, school choice, 
which one would you say is the most important to you or like you're going to go in hot on that one if you get I mean, <laughs> I hope to go in hot on all of them. Um, but uh, what it takes is people paying attention. So this is what I noticed, right? When I was up, because this is what happens. When you go up there to pass legislation, there's like a, a hearing and then you just got to wait your turn. So you're listening to all of these other people's laws and bills and all these things. And so you listen to it and you go, well, that doesn't make any sense. Well, that doesn't make it. Why are we doing that? And so, you know, you have to pay attention and you have to dig deep into the details of an issue and and then focus on that. Um, so on all of the things that I post, I want to, that I, you know, that I put up there, like my core issues, I want to focus on the details. Um, but like for an example, like government accountability, like how do we, how, how do we hold the government accountable? Well, you say, well, how's the money being spent? Right? So we're giving them money. How's it being spent? Okay. I have a story from a teacher. Um, so he's a, he's a coach of a sports team, a girls sports team. And I was talking to him like, Hey man, like what's going on with the funding? Like, you know, I'm trying to learn. And he's like, look, you know, I coached this team. We needed some equipment. It was going to be 10 grand. I asked them for 10 grand. They said, absolutely not. This equipment would have probably lasted us five, seven years. Okay. But then instead of giving me 10 grand, they took 30 grand and sent six kids to Europe on a field trip. Mm -hmm. Like, right. right? Well, where's the accountability? Where's the accountability for that? Where's the accountability for money being spent on contracts and there's failure, right? When there's a failure, if a government gets a contract and then they fail at it, right? And, the, <laughs> you know, not to put them on blast, but it's, it's what I know. The DMV blew, okay, $27 million in the mid-2000, in the teens. I think it was 2017 or 18 or something. They, they, they hired a company to do this upgrade and it didn't work. And they just blew $27 million. They got nothing to show for it, mm -hmm. right? No one got fired. No one, people got promotions. Mm -hmm. People got promotions. People got moved around to different spots. And I'm like, so we can just blow 27 million. So if I have a project and I give it to one of my managers and I say, listen, I need you to do this project. How much is it going to cost? He's like, it's going to take me a thousand. It's going to be a thousand dollars and it's going to be a week and I'll do it in a week. And I'll be like, okay, great. And I give him the money. And then a week goes by, he spends a thousand dollars, comes back and he goes, yeah, hey, you know, um, I tried to do that project, but uh, it, I'm going to need like three more weeks and like four grand. And we like, what? Mm -hmm. Where's my thousand dollars? Oh, yeah. No, dude, you're done. Get out of here. Right. So it's accountability for those errors. If there's accountability for those errors, if people see my pension is at risk or my, you know, I, I don't know about a pension, but, you know, just my job, right? right. Uh, pensions that you did the work, you should get your pension. Um, but like your job is at risk. If you're doing a bad job, then maybe they'll perform better. Right. Right. Maybe they'll go, you know what? Let's triple check this vendor. So we make sure that we get what we're paying for, because mm -hmm. if not, I'm going to get in trouble. And so that's government accountability. So that's something that, you know, we need to focus on is where is this money being spent? And is it being spent on good things? Right. So lots of people use the idiom, you know, leave the world a better place than, than you found it. What, what would that look like for you? Like if you were elected and, you know, let's say you were to go 12 years, what would leaving Nevada a better place look like if you were elected? Um, I mean, getting school choice across would be huge. Um, I know people talk about a lot about education, a lot about education. Um, my kids go to, they go to a private school and it's extremely expensive. Which school? Well, I guess you don't have I to don't say want to say that. Yeah, yeah. You're good. I'll ask <laughs> you. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but it's extremely expensive, but guess what? Like my, my son's in f kindergarten and he probably reads at a third or fourth grade level. Mm -hmm. I mean, just, you know, and Look, maybe, you know, maybe they're on, you know, a different, maybe they're just, you know, got lucky and they're just smart or something. But the curriculum matters. What we teach them matters. And if they understand how to read, then they can take in a lot more information, right? And then apply it in life. Education is the, you know, the key to a lot of this stuff. Because if people are educated, they're not going to make these bad decisions. Right? If you're an educated person, why are you going to steal? 
that doesn't make any sense, right? You're risking, uh, you know, your potential earnings in business or in a, you know, in a high paying job. Like, why would you do that? Why would you risk your future? That's not a good economic decision. But if you're not educated, you, you may not make that decision. So, you know, I want to, yeah, so school choice would be one because I think that would drastically um, improve education. I would want to say that because uh, what, what will happen is there will always be bad legislation. And sometimes it's unintentional. There's just loopholes. So I would, what I would like to do is say, hey, I stopped this from happening. I stopped this bad legislation from happening, you know, and I promoted this legislation or I made compromise on this and we improved, you know, this industry or th this program or whatever. Um, so that, that's what I want to do. I, I want to make a difference in a way that affects, um, you know, that affects everyone in a positive way. And the only way to do that not the only way to do that. One of the best ways to do that is from inside the system. So you want the system to be fixed, you got to go into the system to try to fix it. So that's that's what I'm trying to do. Yeah. So school choice is a really big one for you. I, I would yeah, school choice, government accountability. I mean the you know the law and order stuff. I I don't I don't even know why it's a conversation, but um, yeah, there should be there should be punishments for you know for crime like you. And I under, there there's an emotional argument that's made about. Property is not as important as a life. And I get the logic. I get it. I understand it. But like I said, if this was my only business that got burned down, then what is my life? Right. Right. You don't know if you break someone's window, you know, if you smash and grab their stuff, you know, at their little cell phone store, they might not be able to pay their mortgage. Right. They may go into bankruptcy because they can't afford that. And then guess what? You know, my insurance went up thirty thousand mm. dollars a year because mm. I had a because a lady put set my my place on fire oh, so what am I supposed to I mean so if I couldn't so now I'm gonna have to take that hit on that 30 grand but if I if I couldn't what if that's it what if I can't afford the increase in insurance I have to close my business so that's why it's important to hold people accountable when they when they commit crimes because you you can't just have that permeating through society. Society is going to degrade. It's going to yeah. fall apart. This reminds me, um, can't even remember what class it was in school, but we studied the difference between, it was like a, a philosophy class, and we studied the difference between Thomas Hobbes and John Locke, and both of them had like these, I think it, I think it was those two. I don't know if it was them two specifically, but I know they had these conflicting views of the state of nature and human nature and um, how we're wired. And I can't even remember which one was which. I'm going to have to go look it up after this. But one of them believed that naturally we're chaotic. So if there's no structure, if there's no, like, punishment for things that um, – like there's no reason for them to not do something bad that we'd all just kill each other and we'd be primal and we'd be animalistic. And um, the other one was saying that basically like anarchy, which they don't call it anarchy, but less control is better and that we'd exist better in a, in a free flowing state where we're not trying to be put into these boxes and controlled. And it was a really interesting debate because it basically still happens today. Yeah. You know? Well, there's there's arguments on both sides, right? So I would be a person that says, you know, the free market's going to fix a lot of things. Um, but you have to have a structure for that free market to exist, right? Our, our society is built on trust, right? So if I can't trust you to go into my establishment and not steal, mm -hmm. then we're not going to – the free market's not going to work because people are just going to be stealing stuff. Yeah. Um, so I – there's there's arguments on, on both sides of that. But – I think that, you know, my question to, to everybody is think about a time where you argued with someone over money, where money was involved, like whether it be at work, like, you know, uh, if you work, uh, you know, a lot of people in, 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 in Vegas work for tips. Has there ever been a, a tip issue at your work where it's like somebody left this tip while I was helping them? And it, people change like this yes. when it comes to money. Right. Soon as soon as money is involved, uh, you know, and I've experienced that just trying to. So me trying to organize an industry to fight back against the government, people, even if their businesses are on the line, they don't want to spend the money. Right. So right now I tell people, look, your livelihoods on the line, your future, the future of the state, the future of this country is on the line of this election. And people don't you know, they don't support politicians. And guess what? 
I'll be the first one to say, I was one of those people back in the day too. It's like, I'm not going to give money to these politicians for what, right? But I didn't understand. I didn't understand what it actually takes. Mm -hmm. um, so people will change like this over money. And so think about that. Think about a time. So it's like, if you don't give people some parameters to operate within, right, to have some law and order, I think there is a, a case to say, you know, there is going to be chaos. But at the same time, I'm not like regulate every single you know, aspect of a business right. or a person's life. You have to allow people the, the freedom to choose what they want to do. So there is a delicate balance, but our system has the infrastructure to handle that, mm -hmm. right? We just have to uphold it and maintain it and, and support it based on the original ideas. Because right now we've drifted pretty far away from those original ideas. Mm -hmm. And some good things have come of it, but a lot of bad things have come of it too. Everything in moderation. It's the yin and yang of life. I feel like. Well, I mean, well, some things you got to go 100 percent, though. Well, yeah, <laughs> some things yeah. you do. Like you have. There's there's places where you have to say absolutely not. You know, I will not cave because if you keep giving ground, eventually you're you know like you give an inch, they take a mile. Mm -hmm. That happens. You know, I, I would I would implore people. This is why education is so important. Why don't they they don't teach civics? You get what a semester of government or something in college or in, in high school. Right? Most, I took a, I took a, oh, government, yeah, AP Gov, that was my senior year. Okay, so you I get a year, I know about. you get a year, so maybe, but U.S., you know, so the, the U.S. system, maybe you learn a semester, or I don't know, maybe, whatever it is, a year, a year is not enough. Mm -hmm. You got to be learning about the three branches of government since kindergarten. You have to understand how the system works in elementary school, in middle school, in high school, so when you get out there, you say, oh, okay, I know what to do, right. but... If you don't, guess what? People are going to take advantage. And that's exactly what's happened. People will just give you an emotional argument and say, blah, 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 this is why. And then you go, oh, okay, that sounds good. But you're unaware. You're not educated. And then before you know it, you go, well, I can't afford rent. Why is this? It's like, well, did you know that all your money's going to foreign wars? Or, you know, did you know that um, in your state, why don't I have resources at my rec center? This is happening right now in a lot of democratic states. These people have these rec centers, these community, you know, centers, and they're being used to house, you know, illegal immigrants. And it's like, well, I can't go play. Like, my kids need to play basketball. It's it's summertime. Like, I have to go to work. Like, they usually go to the rec center, but now it's full of these people. Like, well, yeah, because you, you made laws to make yourself a sanctuary place, a sanctuary city or state. And so you have to help these people. Mm -hmm. So now you're paying a price and they're... They didn't know that. They didn't know that that's what they were voting for. So you have to get educated. You have to know what the system is about so then you can properly push back against it. Well, and it's about the way that like our politics function in our country. Like if you look, I know you're probably, you're in the community. So you see like the commercials and the, the type of stuff that they put out there. They're appealing to a super high level thinking because they're just trying to get the vote. It's like a marketing campaign. They're not genuinely trying to educate people. It's different talking with you, you know, but if you're looking at like the commercials that are, that are being like shown to people and like the, the types of tweets that are going out both at a state level and at a federal level, they're appealing to that animalistic part of people. That's like, these are the enemy vote for me because they're just trying to, well, to make yeah, money, because people, you know? It, well, it, it's, it's, they're trying to get the return on their investment into the ad. You have 30 seconds, you have 15 second ad, 30 second ad. Like, what are you supposed to say? If you don't have a sit down conversation to discuss an issue in depth, then you're not going to be able to understand it. So that, <clears throat> that is the problem. So we have to educate people. Like my goal is to say, listen, let's talk, let's talk about it. And the, this is the other thing. I will guarantee you that not every politician knows everything. Right. Okay. And a lot of people were like, oh, well, with this policy, we'll do this. And with this policy, like they may know surface level, but they don't know the details of that. So it's like, don't believe just what anybody says. You need to understand the issue more than a surface level so that you can ask a good question so that you can see if they give you a good answer that convinces you. Right. But at the end of the day, it still comes down to involvement and participation. What are you risking, right? Um, I know everybody spends time on their phone or doing, you know, their hobbies or stuff like that. You have the time to get involved in politics. I know people don't want to, but, you know, this is something that's been said a thousand times. I don't know who the original person is, but if you don't get involved with government, 
government will get involved with you. Yeah. And so we saw that during COVID. We're seeing it right now with inflation and all these other things. So you got to get involved or else you're just going to be another guy or, or, or gal sitting, you know, on the couch just complaining and saying, oh, they, 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 they. Well, look, I mean, they is you. You're they because you're putting these people into office. You're letting them win because if you don't vote, you're allowing people to win that you're not supporting. So you're letting them win. So what are you complaining about? Take some accountability for yourself and say, okay, what do I need to do to make a change? Learn the issues, participate in the election, and vote. It matters. Mm -hmm. Millions of dollars are spent. Trust me, your vote matters. I think that's a great note to end on. Is there anything else that you wanted to add that I didn't cover or didn't touch on? Um, no. I mean, I would just reiterate that point a thousand times until I'm blue in the face. Yeah. Your vote 100% matters. You need to get educated and don't just fall for emotional arguments. Yeah. Understand the other side. Understand why they're making the argument. Okay? Understand why are they making the argument? Why does this make sense to them? And guess what? You may be convinced. You may say, you know what? They're right. Mm -hmm. I was, I'm wrong on this. They're right. Or you can say, you know, these guys... This doesn't make any sense. I think I'm going to go with my original thought. So you, you have to un just dig dig into the issues, educate yourself, and participate. Yeah, perfect. Well, thank you so much for cutting out time. I know you're running a campaign. There's a million things going on. You have family, all that. So I appreciate you taking the time to educate myself, other people. Um, if you guys have any questions or you want to hear more about Raphael's perspectives um, or you want to continue the conversation, you can visit his website at rafaelarroyoforassembly.com. Um, I'll also have his contact information available on most of my social media platforms. Thank you for listening, and I will see you in two weeks to talk more elephants.